As we continue our work of studying the science of man, we will take up the two worlds. Man exists in an environment which is the man-made world. We are considering the society of the man-made world. Now, I'm not talking about the earth. Now, the world is a society. So it is a state of organization where the earth is a planet. So there is two worlds, the man-made world and the real world. Now, we will draw this on a sheet of paper and put the real world at the top and the man-made world at the bottom half of the page. Now, the real world is the world of real living beings, no two of which are alike. No two of us even have the same fingerprints. No two of us have exactly the same taste. No two of us see anything from exactly the same viewpoint as another because we can't stand in the same tracks. So there is the real world is the world of real living beings, no two of which are alike, nor no two of which are in the same environment at the same time. You and I may be in a small room, but you are in my environment and I'm in yours, and that makes it very, very different for each of us. So where there is something that has no two alike and no two in the same environment, there can be no standard set. Each is an entity unto itself. Each of us must know self for self. We cannot have someone else tell us what we are like. If they did, we wouldn't believe them. This is why we are observing the conditioned self within. While there is some general patterns each of us must do the work for self. And we must understand the two worlds for self. So we will observe all the people we know. We'll observe their different tastes. One likes coffee. Another does not like coffee. One likes sugar in their coffee. Another one wants it without sugar. Another wants it with cream. Another wants it without cream. Some want it with cream and sugar. Some can't stand it. Some likes their steaks cooked well done. Some likes them medium. Some likes them medium rare. There is no way you should like coffee or that you should like coffee at all. There is nothing that said you should like your steak cooked any certain way. It is what appeals to your taste. And... Maybe you don't even like steak at all. And this goes on for every conceivable thing. Some people like certain colors. Others do not like colors. We're each a separate entity. And there is no standard for any one of us. There certainly is then in the real, the man-made world is the world of ideals, of ideas, of standards, of machines, and of games. Now, we can have the ideal for how wide the street should be. We should have, can have the ideal for how fast the traffic moves on the street. We can have the ideal of how many parking places there are for a given building. Now, all of these are very useful and necessary for organized society on earth. And the man-made world is very wonderful as long as it's confined to the man-made world. And it is somewhat of a parable of the real world. So there is ideas, many kinds of ideas, and anyone can teach an idea and ask for an examination and see how well you agreed with it. If you could replay it, you're an excellent student. If you did not replay it very well, you're a poor student. You may be a success or a failure according to how well you did this. In the real world, there are ideas 
that gives man an aid in knowing self, but there are not any ideals for you to live up to. As you have noticed, we have given ideas for study, but no ideas nor ideals to live up to. We are only trying to find out what makes the, the self. And we haven't said it should be this to it or what to do to it. These are ideas for study. The other are ideas for accomplishment in the man-made world. And then there is standards. And it's wonderful to have standards for spark clubs and standards for sizes of shoes and standards for dresses, standards for suit sizes. A man who wears a 42 long can order him a 42 long coat. And all you probably have to alter is the length of the sleeves a little bit. If he order, wears a size 12B shoe, he can order a 12B shoe, and all probability will fit very accurately because there are standards set for these. There are standards for sizes of nuts and bolts. Standards for sizes of ridges to use those nuts and bolts. There are standards for drill sizes, to drill a hole, to put the bolt in. So all of these and all the weights and measures that we have are all excellent uses in the man-made world and are necessary for trade and commerce and exchange between one person and another. But there is no standard for the human being. In Washington, D.C., there is a Bureau of Standards, and I'm sure in every other major capital of the world. But if you go through there, you will find that all the standards are for things. There is no human being that has a standard set for it. Now, machines are very useful. They perform great functions and take much of the physical burden off of men. But when man begins to be a machine, it is a perversion because man is designed to operate machines, not be one. But when a man can be controlled by a suggestion, when you can find out from observing him that he has a certain very set opinion or viewpoint, and you challenge that viewpoint or that opinion, you will find that he is suddenly in a state. He is mechanical, and you could control him or manipulate him if you can get him very interested in security, then you can threaten him with lack of security and put him in a panic state. You can stick up for his rights, and he thinks you're his friend, whether he has a right one in the world. He doesn't think about anybody and his privileges. You can tell him how different he is than the common herd, and you can control him. You can blame for him and you can control it. So it is obvious that machines are very useful, but to change a man into a machine may be a perversion. And we have been observing the mechanical behavior of the conditioned self and its mechanical responses, which we could call reaction. And we're beginning to observe that while man is of the real world, a real living being, no two of which are alike, that there is many efforts to have him to respond exactly according to conditioning. Now, the other aspect of the man-made world is the world of games. Now, games are very essential. And not everything that we will refer to as a game is ordinarily referred to a game in the man-made world. Uh, basketball we recognize as being a game, football, baseball, etc. Now for a game there must be players and there must be rules of the game and then there must be an official of some sort and then there's a reward of winning the game or playing the game according to the rules. And if you don't play the game according to the rules in the man-made world there is penalties to be paid and usually rewards for playing the game according to the rule. So business is a game. It has players. It has rules of the game. There is officials of many kinds. 
and there is severe penalties for not playing the game according to the rules, and there are decided advantages for playing the game according to the rules. Marriage is a game. It requires player. It has rules, many of which are set by society, and some of which are set as dealer's choice, as one goes along, like playing dealer's choice poker. And there is officials, and there is severe penalties for not playing the game according to the rules, and possibly many rewards for playing the game according to the rules. And this could go on. Traffic is a game. It has players, and thank goodness there are rules, and thank goodness there are officials, and there is penalties for not playing the game according to the rules, and we have the reward of playing the game According to the rules, there's a reasonable degree of safety in the immense traffic on the streets and highways and freeways. There's four great games which we seldom think of as being games, and they apply to man in, in the real world. So let's consider these games, and we will observe them over a period of time. The first great game is theology. It sets up a standard for man as good. And it, according to the theology, is what is set up as good. There isn't any standard theology for the world. There is many different ones. And theology is not religion, but man's ideas about building an organization around religion, building an institution. And they set up standards of good. And one, it's uh, not good to eat meat on Friday. Another one, it's not good to eat pork at any time. Another one, it's uh, not good to drink coffee. And another one, it's quite all right. And in one, it's very good and acceptable to get a divorce. Another, it is not good to get a divorce. And thousands and thousands of infinite details are set up as good. Any particular person who subscribes to any particular theology finds that they have difficulty maintaining even the outward requirements of the theology and even more difficulty if they're reasonably honest with observing self of keeping the inner state, of not being angry, of not being uh, gossipy, of not uh, stretching the truth a wee bit when it puts one in a good light, uh, which sometimes could be called lying, and it requires a considerable amount of justification in order to make one's behavior jive with the idea of good. So most everyone feels that in some way they're bad, so they feel guilty. The next uh, great Game is power policies. Power policies tells us what is in. A few years ago, it was in to hate the Japanese and love the Russians, among other things. Today, it is very in to love the Japanese. Most of everything we have comes from Japan, including the tape recorder we are recording these talks on. And uh, we are to not approve too well of the Russians. A few years ago, we were to hate the Italians and the Germans. Today, we love them. What's in? A little while ago, it was very in to dislike China. Before that, it was very in to like China. Now it's thawing. It's getting in to feel they're pretty well all right, at least for some purposes. So we have what's in and what's out. And most of you people can agree with all the in. So most everyone feels that in some way they're out. So they are now bad and out in many respects. They're out of step with the general run of everything. Then comes the healing art is a great game. The healing art set up a standard for normal. Now the speaker at one time studied some of the healing arts and 
on one occasion that is recalled at an opening day of the enrollment or entering to study of the freshman class, the dean of the school made a talk in which he said that for the first two years, this class would study the normal so that when they were in the third and fourth and fifth years and in clinics, they would recognize the abnormal. Now, at that moment, that sounded very reasonable, very logical, and very sound. However, studying the normal consisted in studying mannequins, charts, books, and listening to many lectures of what the normal was. So an idea was established. And that was a great number of years ago. And until this day, neither I nor anyone I've ever seen fits the normal all the way. So everybody is a patient then. Everybody is abnormal. And of course, we're generally conditioned to feel that when we don't fit the norm, that we are in a very bad situation and that we need decided treatment to restore towards the normal. And uh, there's usually a considerable bit of Disappointment over not being normal, a feeling of being unfortunate or hurt that one is not normal, and one looks for the blame, and one comes up with fear, which brings about chemical imbalance and neuromuscular tension from the various hormones in response to the fear, and then it requires adaptation, and then we are firmly convinced we are abnormal. And then gradually has emerged another great game of big business. Big business by advertising constantly suggests that we are ugly. Now, we're using that word ugly. You may smell ugly. So you will need ultimate endless amount of deodorants. Your hair is probably ugly, so you will need the proper shampoos and the proper hairsprays and the proper coloring and even a wig to cover it up so you will then be pretty. Uh, we're constantly bombarded with suggestions that our cars are old and therefore ugly, our homes are old and ugly, our furniture is ugly, our appliances are now old and ugly, and that we should all be buying new ones. So everyone begins to feel that they are ugly in some way. You probably weigh too much. You're too fat, so you are ugly. And you should fit the ideal of a skinny one or whatever. The clothes are now out of date, and they are therefore ugly, and we must buy the pretty ones or we will be embarrassed and feel badly and we will be looked down on and disapproved of and ignored or rejected as unsuccessful people, and we will be inferior. So, of course, we spend great sums of money, obligate ourselves with tremendous amounts of debt in order to be pretty, normal, and we struggle mentally with being good and probably a little belligerently with being in. So we have the four dual basic urges. That first basic decision as to the purpose of living is the source of suggestion for manipulation of man as a machine. He wants to have pleasure and comfort. He wants to have attention. He wants to have approval. He wants to feel important. And big business, theology, the healing art, And power policies all tells him he is in terrific danger unless he extends himself to a great degree in order to try to gain what they tell him he is not at the moment. You are bad, you are ugly, you are not in, and you are abnormal. Now, if we go back and look again at the real world, There is no two alike, nor no two are in the same environment at the same time. Therefore, there can be no standard. When we begin to see this and observe it, we recognize 
that the normal and that the good and that the in and that the pretty are rather false, but we have been conditioned with them. And so, being conditioned, we are subject to suggestion that we are bad, ugly, abnormal, and out, and that by spending sums of money or performing certain rites or rituals, or that by advocating and agreeing with certain political ideas that we shall have a utopia where we are all pretty and good and in and normal. And of course to do this we are only required to give up that which is really human. Total independence. Being independent. The dependent person of course is mechanical and can be manipulated and we are seeing this is happening all around. So we are studying the human being, I, so that we will be aware of these situations, not that we condemn them or we don't justify them. They simply do exist, and possibly some of us don't prefer to be a machine. So being aware of the two worlds, we are aware of what belongs in the real world, and we are aware of what belongs in the man-made world. We are not opposed to either one. We recognize the man-made world as being very necessary, and we exist in it. But we also recognize we are not of the man-made world, that we are of the real living world, the world of real living beings. And as we begin to observe, from the standpoint of looking down to observe the man-made world without condemning it or without justifying it. But we see what belongs in it and we don't be of the man-made world. We are observing it, not identifying with it. We recognize games and we would like to play many games. When we play a game, we play the game according to the rules, to the best of our ability. But we don't play the game of the great games that says that man has an ideal standard and that he should fit to it. You see, this is the beginning of the world that everyone is born into. A world of ideals. A world, then, of self-improvement to fit those ideals from many different directions. And in a world that has signs and demonstrations that one has improved. And then the world of blaming. Wherein when one doesn't find the sign and wonder, one looks for the blame. One has anticipation that if one practices self-improvement, that there will be self-improvement. But frequently that anticipation or expectation is disappointed because there is no way that any human being can fit an ideal because we're ever-changing, because we're in an ever-changing environment, in an ever-changing situation. One may be sitting in their living room very serene and peaceful and joyful. The phone rings or the doorbell rings and there is a very unusual piece of news. Some loved one has been injured or is in great difficulty. Suddenly one's heart is beating wildly, etc. Is that normal? It is what is happening. And there isn't anyone that says you should immediately have something that would slow the heartbeat down to 72 times a minute. Maybe you go out and mow the lawn with a push mower or you cut pull weeds or you do some violent physical exercise and your heart pounds hardly. Is that something wrong or is it a normal adaptation? You see, everything is a normal adaptation and there is no such thing as an abnormal human being. There is such a thing as an adapting human being. There is no such thing as a bad human being. There are mechanical condition people who can be stimulated by pushing a button to do almost anything, either that button from within or without. 
but there is no bad human being. There is only unconscious ones, or semi-conscious ones, or shall we say conditioned ones. There is no such thing as a pretty individual or an ugly individual. There is only a person who expresses outwardly their inner state of being. And they're all perfect for their particular state of being. And there is no such thing as a abnormal person. There's only the adaptation person going on. No such thing is ugly. There is the outward expression of the inner state. And there's no such thing as in or out. We each see from a different standpoint, and obviously we will see it a little bit different. And part of the understanding of man is to understand that. As we do that, we find there is less disappointments in the world because we did not expect them to all be like peas in a pot. And even the peas in a pot are different. We did not expect them to be turned out like spark plugs and etc. So, let's write us a little sheet out this week. And we're going to do one little thing is we're going to find how many times I am caught by the suggestion that I am abnormal, that I am ugly, that I am out of step, and that I am bad. How many times are we caught with the suggestion, either from within or from without, It doesn't make any difference. We're going to write down whether I thought of it from an old suggestion or whether from a fresh suggestion coming in that I got a sense of being something in the man-made world that had a standard of normal, pretty, good, and in. And that some way or other I didn't fit the standard. In other words, we're going to observe a different level of mechanical being this week. And we will not stop doing those things we have been checking up on because we are being acquainted with man and the world in which he lives. Not with the idea of improving him to fit some ideal, but of being conscious, being aware moment by moment of what is And we're being more observant of the fallacies of what ought to be, which is the ideal. Man's great conflict is trying to change what is into some idea of what ought to be in the real world. The man-made world, we can change cars, we can change houses, we can make some more fit our purposes and everything. But when we start trying to make man into what he ought to be, we are fiddling in a wrong area. So let's be aware of it when we are caught in that trap this week. Not with condemning or not with trying to justify it, but simply being aware